My name is Tiku Majumdar. I'm, the, I'm a professor in the physics department as well as the current director of the Science Center at Williams, and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Robert Budnitz, and let me just say a few words about him. Um, in addition to being someone with impressive national and global uh, insights and connections to this important topic um, about which he'll speak tonight, um, he's a person who has some interesting local connections, and I thought I would mention those as well. Um, we're grateful that he's here this month and th that he's willing to, uh, to join us um, and talk to us this evening. He's an expert on nuclear power, on reactor safety, on waste management and safety. Uh, he graduated from Pittsfield High School, uh, married locally, and uh, his, uh, into the Presky family, a family who's, who's, uh, who's very well known and whose generosity is very well known on this campus. Um, he was a graduate of Yale College and uh, got his PhD in experimental physics from Harvard. Uh, then went to Lawrence Berkeley Lab, where he worked in the Energy and Environment Division, including a stint as head of that division. Uh, did a stint in, in the Nuclear Reg uh, Regulatory Commission. Then on to Lawrence Livermore National Lab, including uh, work with the Department of Energy. Back to Lawrence Berkeley Lab, where he is now. And in particular, uh, it's important to note that when the Obama administration wanted to put together a kind of a local US uh, task force to coordinate reactions to the Fukushima um, disaster uh, that uh, Energy Secretary Steve Chu put together a panel of five U.S. scientists, including uh, Robert Budness. So it's uh, particularly um, a great pleasure to welcome him to Williams, not to Williamstown, but to Brooks Rogers Hall, maybe to this evening. Um, and uh, we look forward to his remarks. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I got dressed up, which I um, probably shouldn't have. <laughs> and I have two other local things to say. Um, how about those Red Sox? We're in first place at the All-Star break, right? <laughs> and secondly, um, a half a century ago, my wife and I were married in the Williams College faculty house just right over here. And she's sitting right over there, so it shows you 50 years, you can do it too. Um, I'm going to try to explain what happened in Japan. I'm going to try to explain the details as best I can for a lay audience about what led to the accident. And then at the end, I'm going to try to explain what it means for us. It's awfully hard to, uh, to predict the future, of course. I can't even predict something that's going to happen a month from now, never minding long-term future. But I'm going to try to give some insight into the sort of things that um, we already know and see if we can figure out, if we can, uh, what it means. Uh, a lot of you uh, uh, perhaps uh, don't know how extensive nuclear power is around the world. We have just over 100 nuclear power plants in the United States, 104 of them to be exact. It generates about 20% of our electricity. There are 400 around the world. We have about 100 of them. Japan has about 50 of them. And, you, and here's a map of where they are. They're on about 15 sites all over Japan. And the nuclear power plants there generate about a third of their electricity. So it's a lot of electricity. They decided very early on to have an important nuclear power program because they really needed it. We don't in the sense that we've got a lot of coal and we've, we've got other ways of making electricity. But they don't have any natural resources to make electricity at all except hydroelectric. So, they, so rather than import oil and gas and, and coal, they made a decision very early to have an extensive nuclear power program, and they do. I said it generates about a third of their electricity. And you should know that until this accident, they had the reputation around the world of having one of the very best programs of, of, of reactor safety. The, everything they did was great. When everybody else around the world, including me, went there, we observed that. The records of uh, small incidents were very few and not important. They just did a wonderful job with their design and maintenance. It was just a terrific program. People emulated them. And all of a sudden, this disaster has revealed to us, everybody around the world, that things weren't what we thought in Japan. And we're still not sure whether that's going to be true of us, too. I'll come to that later. That is, it's obvious now that the Japanese made some fundamental errors, at least at this station and at some of the others, which I'm going to explain to you. Now, it doesn't mean, by the way, that all these plants are unsafe. These accidents are pretty unusual and very rare, but it still shouldn't have happened, and I'm going to try to explain why. So there they are. You can see on this map, and that, that bullseye is the earthquake off the, off the northeast coast that happened on March 11th. It's now uh, just four months today. Um, along the northeast coast, there are 14 nuclear power plants. They're shown on this, uh, on this map. 
There are three of them at a place called Onagawa, and then down the coast there are the six at Fukushima 1. That's where they had the accident. And next to them is Fukushima 2 with four more, and those 10 are pretty much identical in their design. You should know that they had the accident at Fukushima 1, but at Fukushima 2, they didn't have an accident. They, they rode it out fine, and they shut down, and everything's fine there. And it's only a few miles away. It's about five or six kilometers from the other one. And then another one down the coast. All of them are pretty much identical. And you can see that the six at, um, at Fukushima 1 were all commissioned in the 70s. Here's a, um, here's a, a better explanation in an a, 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 uh, airplane view. You can see the six units there. There are these big box buildings. There are, um, let's see if I can point them out. Well, you can see the great big box buildings there. Um, and you have no idea how big they are until I show you a picture that really uh, uh, shows how big they are. But um, the crucial thing for the purposes of this accident, besides their being right next to the sea, is notice what was going on. The first three units were operating. Units one, two, they were operating. Each of them had a very large disastrous core meltdown accident, a very serious accident. The next three weren't operating. They were in an outage. Plants go into an outage every 18 months or so, sometimes for about a month to add new fuel, and then they start up again. But in this case, all three of them were in an extended outage going, going on for six or nine months because they were 30 years or more into this. They were repairing and replacing some major equipment so they could run for another 30 years. And that was scheduled to be done on the other three later. So this is crucial. You need to remember it's units one, two, and three that had the accident. Four, five, and six were in an outage. They were shut down. There was nothing wrong. Everything was fine. Now, um, here's a, um, uh, uh, without looking at the print up there, this is a picture I took from someplace else to show you, and I, oh, does this work? Yeah, look at that. That's great. I can point with that. To show you about the earthquake and the tsunami. This was, as I, uh, perhaps you know, the largest earthquake that has stricken Japan in recorded history, which goes back 2,000 years. It was a magnitude 9. And the magnitude scale is a, is a logarithmic scale. It's 30 times more energy than a magnitude 8, the magnitude 8. And this earthquake struck about 70 miles offshore, and its length was 400 kilometers, about 250 miles long. That's what this, this length shows here. Now, it's important to understand how this earthquake worked. Let me go back because I'm going to, oops. I'm going to show you how this worked because it's important to understand how the tsunami comes about and why, for example, we don't have a threat like this in California. This fault ruptured by dropping like this. Okay, Dropping like this. One side dropped compared to the other side, as opposed to in California where our faults go like this, side to side. And you can't get a big wave no matter what you do side to side compared to something like this. In the middle of this 250-mile long rupture, the, uh, the one side went down about 75 feet. All right, you've got to listen to that. Over about 10 seconds. Went down 75 feet. Now, it went down less as you went to the ends, but it went down, and if you do that, try that in your bathtub, you get a big wave. It's a, <laughs> right? It went down, I mean, it's just a huge, huge rupture. And it dropped like this. It's a subduction zone earthquake. And that produced, and this picture here, I'll sh I can show with this little thing I'm, I can do from here, and you can see it. That produces a wave that goes in both directions. You know, it goes down like this, and then the other one does this. It goes in both directions. The, this, is, this shows it just after it. The one that's going east crosses the Pacific. It finally came to California, but by the time it got there, it wasn't any, you know, it dissipated. But the other one's going west, and it impacted the shore from the su southern end of the Hokkaido Island up north, and this whole section here, it impacted that shore with very, very large tsunamis. That were, uh, that were way beyond anything they had anticipated, and it was over 250 miles. You just, uh, and it was the tsunami that caused the trouble. Just want to let you uh, let that sink in. Now, most people think a tsunami looks like that, and it doesn't. I put up this picture. I got it off the web. It's one of the most famous uh, pieces of art in the history of art. Centuries old, uh, a famous old uh, um, woodcut that was then you know, colored. And this is what a lot of people have in their mind when they think about a big wave. But it's not that. What this is is a wave of a completely different kind. And I drew this just by hand to show you. What you see there, uh, imagine this thing is moving from left to right. And what you see there is what this wave looks like. The wavelength is a couple miles long. 
And out in the open, open ocean, the height of it is about 10 meters or 30 feet, roughly. That's this one. Uh, it varies a little bit, but it's roughly like that. And so if you, if you had a ship out there, it would go up a little. After all, a ship is higher than 30 feet. You could draw it on a thing. It would go up a little bit and go down a little bit. In the open ocean, the ship wouldn't get any trouble. It, just, it would see it, but it wouldn't be disturbed by it. But this thing is moving at 200 miles per hour, a little more, actually. And as it goes to the right, and it's going towards the shore, suddenly it hits the shore. And depending on the topography, whether it's shallow or whether it's steep and whether there's a harbor that channels it or whether it's spreading out, you get different heights of tsunamis there. But it's not a wave like that. It is, in fact, a sea level rise that takes place over about a minute. And that minute, it goes from wherever it was up to, let's say, in the, in the case of this particular reactor site, up 46 feet. But it's a sea level rise, and then a minute or two later, it goes back down. And then, by the way, it goes out, and then there's a slosh again. But it's that, it, so it's not, I want to insist, it's not a wave. It's a sea level rise. And that sea level rise varied from one site to the next considerably. And uh, although at the reactor, it was about 45 or 46 feet. Oops. Now, here's a picture of it. This is sort of a stylized picture of the reactor. And down at the bottom in this blue line, oops, down at the bottom of this blue line is where the sea level used to be. And here's this great big wave coming up. This drawing was done uh, three days after the accident. They estimated it as being 10 meters, but actually we now know reliably that it was about 14 meters, uh, 45 or 6 feet. And this wave came up and completely swamped everything there. It came up against the buildings. It went around the back of them. It, it flooded everything. And it was that flood that caused the trouble at this reactor. The problem was that the turbine building that, uh, the, the turbine building that housed the diesel generators that they, was essential power was below grade, below, excuse me, was below the grade of that building. It was above the, the, the sea, but the tsunami swamped it. And that was the cause of the accident. Okay. So now let me go back and explain what they did. They anticipated a tsunami at this site would be at the maximum size of perhaps 5 meters, 16 or 17 feet. So they built a 7 meter seawall, 22 or 3 feet, something like that. If you build a 7 meter seawall and you get a 14 meter tsunami, it goes right over it. Never saw it. Or to put it in English units, you build a, 40, a 21 or 2 foot wall, and the water, it's not a wave, it's a water rise, goes right over it, just went right over it. And, uh, and, it, 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 and, and it swamped everything that was below it, including all that electric power, and the electric power is what caused the trouble. So um, let me try to explain this uh, briefly. All reactors all around the world need electric power to run a whole lot of equipment. And because they generate electricity, you'd say, well, why don't they get it from there? But they can't get it from there because you never know when you have to shut down. So in fact, they get electric power from the grid. The earthquake knocked off the grid. Nothing surprising about that. That happens all over. Now, when the earthquake knocked out the grid, the reactors behaved just as they're supposed to behave. Everything was fine. As soon as that happened, the control rods go into the reactor and shut down the chain reaction. And it, and it happened properly, and it shut it down, and everything was fine. And then immediately thereafter, because you need electric power, every reactor has two diesel generators. They actually look like those big choo-choo trains that I was familiar with when I was a kid. They're the size from here, to, from here to that wall, these great big diesel generators. Every reactor had two of them. They had 12 of them on site. And all they needed was one or two of those to work, and they could have saved everything. All but one of them was totally swamped by this event. One of them ran, and it saved units five and six. But um, the others didn't, and uh, that's what caused the trouble. The water knocked out the diesel generators. And not only did it knock out the diesel generators themselves, but the diesel generators were attached to electrical wiring that had to go to the, distribute that. And all of that was in switchyards, and all that was swamped, too, by the water. And it was all destroyed by the water. And that was the cause of the accident. Now, let me just talk about tsunami defense before I get to the reactor. You can't read this, and I can't either. <laughs> but I, but, but I, I went to a talk uh, by an American about this. This is a Japanese slide. And along the bottom are a whole bunch of sites that go from north to south 250 miles. North on the left, north to south. And the big red dots are the sizes of the tsunami heights. And you can see the highest one, way up at the top here, is 27 meters 
which is 80 feet. But there's a whole lot of them in here between 15 and 20 meters, all just all around these big red dots. And as I said, at, at the plant itself, it was uh, 14 meters. But down below are a whole lot of different little X's and O's and stuff like that. And each of those is a tsunami wall that the Japanese built. Some of them were at ports, some of them were at little towns, some of them were at, uh, at residential areas, some of various things. And so they had decided they were going to have big tsunamis, and they built these tsunami walls. And they were a big ones. Some of these tsunami walls were 15 meters, which is, you know, you can figure that out, almost 50 feet high. More typically, they were 6 and 8 meters, which is, you know, 20 feet, 25 feet up tall. But you can see that just about everywhere, the tsunami was bigger than they had planned. More or less everywhere. It wasn't the reactor that made that mistake. It was the whole Japanese infrastructure made that mistake, and the reactor was one of the victims of that. Now, just before I go talk about the reactor, I just want to explain something that's really important for you to understand. The tsunami came 45 minutes after the earthquake. They had a tsunami warning system, and it worked. 440,000 people evacuated successfully during those 45 minutes. 26,000 didn't. It's about 5%. 26,000 people lost their lives in that tsunami. About 10,000 were swept to sea, and they've never been heard from again, and they probably won't be. The others they found. So a successful evacuation of 95% of the people doesn't sound like, it's, uh, like they weren't prepared. They just didn't get everybody. Some old people and some people that couldn't you imagine. But nevertheless, 440,000 people got out. 26,000 didn't. They're dead. And it was because of this failure that is shown there. They just completely missed that. The reactor, too, missed it. I'm not placing blame here, I'm just describing. And that's the crucial uh, cause of this accident. And um, today, those 440,000 people that evacuated, most of them have reoccupied their homes, but there are about 100,000 people whose homes destroyed by the tsunami, you've seen the pictures, they look like pickup sticks, the game I used to play when I was a little kid. Uh, about 100,000 people in, uh, are out of house and home and businesses, and those are going to be a tremendous reconstruction job. They, they estimate it's going to be 500 billion or 700 billion to, to, um, to fix that. It's going to take a long time. And in the meantime, what we're talking about is the reactor, which was bad enough. But if you're, if you're Japanese, the true disaster is this other thing, too. Let's not forget that. Now, uh, I'm going to now switch to the reactor. This is a boiling water reactor. All of the reactors at issue here are boiling water reactors. There's another kind, which is, uh, there, there are more of them actually than these around the world. About a third of the reactors around the world are these boiling water reactors. The others are so-called pressurized water reactors that have an intermediate loop, but I'll just describe this in a minute. What you do in a reactor is you boil water to make steam to drive a turbine, and the turbine makes electricity. That's how it works. And the water is boiled in a great big vessel, the vessel's 40 feet high, although the fuel itself is only 12 feet in, in height. And in there, the chain reaction makes heat. The heat boils the water. Oops, back here. The water goes around, the water goes, the steam, the steam at the top goes out this loop. I have this little arrow that I'm showing. It goes out this loop, and it goes to a turbine, and it spins a turbine, and that's what makes the electricity. Of course, the generator then sends electricity out to the grid. After the turbine, the spent steam gets, uh, gets condensed by seawater. In this case, it happens to be seawater down here. It gets condensed back into, by cold water into water again, and then it gets pumped back into the reactor and goes around the loop. And these very large pumps are what keep that whole thing going because it wouldn't, it wouldn't run around the loop without it. And that's a normal operating reactor. It's inside a great big vessel. This vessel is 40 feet high, roughly. It's uh, 8 inches or so of steel all the way around. And it's inside a big containment vessel, which is concrete, many feet of concrete that surround the whole thing. And that whole great big containment uh, vessel is intended to keep the radioactivity inside if there's an accident. Now, I'm just going to show you a picture of the fuel, because the fuel melted here. And you, you probably, the common English jargon now uses the word core melt. Or, you know, I'll explain what that is. The fuel in these reactors are rods 12 feet long that are about the size of my little finger. Oh, they're a little bigger, maybe the size of one of my intermediate fingers. They're about that size, they're 12 feet long, and they're arranged into assemblies of 8 by 8, 64. Actually, it says 62 because there are a couple control rods in there, but it's really 64 of these things. They're, they're about that size in a box, and they're these long rods, and they're 12 feet long, 
and they consist, each one of them, of a fuel rod made out of a metal called zirconium. And zirconium is chosen because it has wonderful nuclear properties and also wonderful heat exchange properties. And then the fuel itself is the uranium oxide, and it looks like a little aspirin tablet, a little bigger. Little tablets, and they just get put into these rods, 12 feet of them. These tablets going inside, the uranium oxide. They're assembled into these assemblies, these eight by eights, they're about this big. And as this one says, there were 500 odd assemblies in this big core. This great big core, it's about the size, say, eight feet around. And it has all these assemblies, 500 of them, each of which has 64, well, it's 62 rod, um, fuel rods, each of which has those pellets. So there are 30, it says 33,000 fuel rods, and I don't know how many million pellets, because there are a lot of them. Now, this reactor has a chain reaction, and that gets real hot in those uranium rods. Very, very hot. And that heat heats the water that makes the steam, that makes the turbine run. But the danger in a reactor, and here's where the, you should need to understand this, the danger is that if you don't keep that underwater, if the water somehow goes down, the thing will melt. And the melt releases radioactivity, and then the radioactivity has to be contained, first in the vessel, later in that containment, and if it isn't contained, it goes out, and that's a big radioactive release. But it can't happen unless the core melts, and the core won't melt if it's underwater. Of course, if you have a big pot full of water and there's heat, it'll, it'll boil. So you have to, even in a shutdown situation, you have to keep um, replacing the water that's boiled off in order to keep it underwater, in order to keep the thing safe. And that's the trick in reactor safety. What we do in reactor safety is make sure the systems are in place to keep it underwater at all times, and it has to be kept underwater for years, even after it's shut down. When a reactor is shut down, that is the control rods go in, it nevertheless generates heat because of the residual radioactivity that starts out at a few percent. A few days later, it's down to one or two percent. But even here we are four months later, it's a fraction of a percent. And with a reactor like this, it's, it, it's tens of thousands of kilowatts of, uh, of heat being generated right now, all the time, from each of those reactors because the heat is still, it's the radioactive decay. And you have to keep that underwater, and that's the thing you've got to do. Now, let me show, just show you a picture for scale of the size of this thing. Oops. This is, uh, this is a large, large one under construction. Browns Ferry is in Alabama. This picture was taken in the 70s. I'm just showing it to show you what the size of it is. This thing in the middle is this great big containment structure. That's the steel structure. This large round thing that looks like a donut at the bottom, we call that the torus. It's full of water, and I'll show you what its function is in a minute. And just to see what the scale of this thing, on the bottom here, this is the cap. And that big building I showed you goes on top of that. So that plan view that you saw, it's a huge building. And just to show you the scale, there's a gal right at the top. You see her? Right up there? By the way, I don't know that that's a gal, but. So th this is just to show you what the scale is of these things, because I'm now going to go to a drawing. And without this, you wouldn't have the feeling for what the big scale is. Drawing. So here's a drawing. Oops. Here's a drawing. This pink thing is the vessel with the fuel on the inside. And as I said, the fuel is only 12 feet of this 40-odd foot length, and that's steel. The thing that looks like a light bulb here, shaped like a light bulb, is the containment structure that's made out of uh, concrete, and that's intended to keep everything inside if it escapes from the vessel. The containment structure, though, is attached to this big torus. It, oops, it's only shown, oops, it's only shown here a couple of them, but it's this great big, you saw how big it was, a great big uh, donut-shaped thing. And it's uh, mostly full of water, not completely, mostly full of water. And the function of that I'll come to in a minute because it's very important in accidents. Now, the other crucial thing about this design is way up at the top of the building is a spent fuel pool. It looks like an Olympic swimming pool, except that it's 40-odd feet deep, but it's, 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 it's and not quite as long as that, but it's a huge pool because when they, when they take the fuel out of the reactor, they move the fuel into the spent fuel pool where it sits there for several years, usually five or more, underwater, because it's got to be underwater, because otherwise it's hot. And it'll melt. it'll melt if it isn't underwater, and it has to be kept underwater. Of course, it, of course it, it, it boils the water a little bit, so you have to keep adding new water, but it doesn't boil it very much for, for old fuel. And that's the, that's the spent fuel pool that's in here. And that's, that was, that was a, a piece of this accident that I'm going to come to later, was that one of the, uh, one of the reactors, uh, we were afraid that the spent fuel pool had been compromised too, although in the, in the end we learned that it wasn't. So 
as I said, this is just a stylized picture, and now I'm going to show you a cutaway that General Electric produced uh, of one of these reactors just to show you how big this thing is. You've got to realize this, this red thing in the middle is the pressure vessel, and it's 40. You saw, you saw the picture of that great big thing, with a, I said, with a, the woman sitting at the top. Well, this building is bigger still, and this sort of building is the picture that I showed of those reactors in Japan. These are very, very large structures. Okay? And then finally, way up on the top is a spent fuel pool. It's in here somewhere. You can see here. And here's a picture of an empty one. Actually, it's deceiving because this is 40 feet, 47 feet deep, something like that. I don't remember exactly. Uh, they differ slightly. And if that's how deep it is, you can see how big it is. This is a couple hundred feet around, all the way around. It's full of water. And of course, this is an empty one. Now, let's come to the accident. Okay. This is the normal operating configuration. I showed it stylized, but this has got more detail. The fuel, which is stylized, this red stuff in here, um, is hot because the chain reaction is running, and it boils water. In the normal operating configuration, the water turns to steam, and the steam is this red line going out the top. It goes up here and drives a turbine. The turbine drives a generator, makes electricity. The spent uh, steam goes down to a condenser. It gets condensed from the sea. It's pumped back in, goes back around the loop. So the normal configuration is just goes around the loop. And, uh, and the, these reactors were the smallest one was generating 400,000 kilowatts, 400 megawatts. The, most of them were 700. The, the, the largest uh, unit on that site was about 1,000 megawatts. These are very big uh, power generators. And as I said, even when they're shut down, a few percent of that is still there. So what happens is the earthquake comes. They, they automatically shut the thing down by putting the control rods in, stops the chain reaction, and they're down from a full power to just a, 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 a small percentage of the power. So the steam in this normal configuration still does what it does, but there isn't enough steam to drive the turbine, so they have a bypass valve, and the steam goes, goes out this loop, goes, goes around, gets condensed, and in a normal safe configuration, it just stays in that loop forever, as long as you want. And the units that are safe, units five and six on this site, that's just what's going on. Well, actually, I just misspoke. They, did, they, they, they didn't have any fuel in them, but other, other reactors that, that shut down, that's just what goes on. The trouble is that loop requires electricity. There's this pump here, this red thing, has a little stylized. That requires electricity to run that loop. Oops. Now, they lost the grid right away. Immediately, those large diesel generators all started. I said there were two in each unit. There were 12 of them on the site. They all started. And they produced electricity. And for the first 45 minutes, that worked fine. Along came the tsunami, knocked it out. That loop doesn't work anymore. Uh-oh. That's what we call a blackout. In a blackout situation, you're in real trouble, except that every reactor is designed specifically to run in a blackout situation with a special pump that doesn't require electricity. And here's how it works. Got the next loop here. Um, the steam that's coming off of the top of the reactor goes to a steam dump, but a fraction of it is bled off and actually driven to a turbine, and there's a turbine-driven pump driven by the steam that drives the water around in this loop. And that keeps the thing full of water. Now, let me describe how it actually works. Here's the steam-driven pump, and it doesn't show the steam line, but it's this green thing. It takes suction water from this great big torus. That's the emergency supply. And it takes the water from the torus, pumps it into the reactor, and, and because it's boiling, keeps the level up. The steam, on the other hand, goes out a relief valve. It isn't shown. It goes out the top through a relief valve, some of the steam, and goes back around, and it gets condensed down in the torus. So the steam is going in the torus. Of course, when it's condensed, the torus is heating up. This system is designed to work for several days, the notion being that after several days, you'll be able to restore electric power, either restore diesels if you lost them, or restore offsite power, or whatever. And this system is supposed to work for several days. And if it does, it keeps the reactor underwater, and everything is fine. Okay. And let me go to the next slide. Um, yeah. Okay, so here's the next slide, and this sort of shows, uh-oh, because there's a really crucial thing that um, all reactors have that you need to understand. All of the systems that run without electricity, like that system I showed you, require batteries to control their control systems and so on. And so the reactors have huge battery banks. If you know what an automobile battery looks like, we all do. Imagine 200 of them in a room, 
all ganged together. And imagine four or five rooms just like that. There's batteries all over the, in these great big battery, battery banks. And those batteries are enough power to keep those control systems running for days. That, that was, that's the point. And therefore, you have control and you have instrumentation and readouts and you know what the pressure is and you know what the, so on. So the people in the control room understand what's going on with these batteries. But in fact, um, in every one of the three reactors that got in trouble, the batteries ran out before they could, before they could restore power. Okay? The reason is they couldn't restore the grid. The grid was just shot because of the earthquake. And uh, they, had, um, they, they couldn't restore the on-site diesels either, but they tried to bring in off-site power, but the roads were shot. They couldn't bring it in. And when they finally got a couple of them in, they tried to hook them up to the electrical systems. It's sort of the analog of a plug that you have to plug it in to go somewhere. And those were all damaged by the tsunami. So it took them almost a week before they restored electric power to these sites. And as soon as the batteries ran out, and as soon as these steam-driven pumps failed, the boiling began, and a few hours later, the core melted in every one of those. So that's, that's what happened. They lost off-site power, they lost on-site power. These systems worked with the steam. They ran on batteries. The batteries ran out. And when the batteries ran out, they were stuck. They tried all sorts of things. They couldn't restore any electric power at all. They actually lost reading, so they didn't know what the pressure and temperature were all over the place. They were in just very serious uh, difficulties trying to understand what was going on, never mind trying to, trying to be able to manipulate valves and things because they didn't have any power at all. And that all happened uh, because they didn't have enough time to restore any power because the earthquake had caused so much chaos they couldn't bring in things and there was a whole lot, just a whole lot of failures one after the other, cascading things that sort of puzzle us. You would have thought, I would have thought that somewhere along the line for each of those three damaged units they would have been able to restore something but they didn't. So here's what happened. Unit one, for example, unit two, unit three, they were the three that were running. In each case, at different times when it happened, for, for one of the units, for example, this steam-driven pump ran for almost three days. For another one, it ran for less than a day. And for unit one, there's a little different system, and it only lasted about eight hours. As soon as you lose that, the steam, the, it's steaming. You're losing water. You can't replace it. The level comes down. And after the level comes down, the core becomes uncovered. I showed you the picture of those rods. The core becomes uncovered. And as soon as the core becomes uncovered, you get into real trouble, and here's why because the things are very, very hot when they're not underwater and the water isn't taking it away. And all the fuel is clad in a zirconium cladding, this metal sheath that I showed you. It's about the size of your finger with a little um, uranium inside. And that zirconium, which is a wonderful, uh, has wonderful properties otherwise, will oxidize when in the presence of steam. And here's what the reaction is for those chemists in the room. It's a simple reaction. There's, there's, it, it's coming down and there's steam. The zirconium reacts with the steam. You can see the reaction, H2O, but that's steam. It produces zirconium oxide and hydrogen. Now, what's troubling about this is this is an exothermic reaction. That is, every, every one of these that goes, every molecule that happens, releases energy, so it makes it even more energetic, and it drives the reaction that goes, and as soon as it gets started, you can't stop it unless you put water in there. It doesn't slow itself down. It actually, it actually speeds itself up. And this happens above about 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. And ultimately, by the way, it gets hot enough so the uranium, which is now a eutectic with the metal and stuff, it finally melts at a very hot temperature of 4,800 degrees. That's a really hot temperature, okay? But that happened here. In all three of those units, water came down, the zirconium water reaction, the steam reaction made uh, oxide and hydrogen, the zirconium went away, kept heating up, the uranium finally got hotter, but by the way, without the cladding, it sort of falls down into a, what I would call a rubble bed. It looks like a pile of you know, these little pellets at the bottom of the reactor. And of course, it continues to boil off. And finally, you get something like this. This is a very stylized picture, but this is the idea. You have this core debris in the bottom of the lower head of that vessel. And this is tons and tons and tons of this stuff. I can't remember how many. I should remember, but I can't quite remember. And it gets at the bottom of the vessel, and it's hotter than a pistol. 
In fact, as it heats up, this is shown when it's still not hot enough to melt, but as it heats up finally, the uranium starts to melt, and we, we, we call that sort of a, a corium. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, this is a, a hot molten liquid here with just a little bit along the bottom, and it'll, it'll melt, it'll just, all of it will melt um, if there's no water to take away the heat or no way to take away the heat, and that's just what happened in these reactors. So let me go back up. This reaction takes place, it melts, it all falls to the bottom, and it's hotter than a pistol. It's very, very, you have no idea what 4800 Fahrenheit is, it's just incredibly hot. And there's hydrogen that has evolved into this, um, this pressure vessel from that reaction I told you about. The hydrogen overpressures, overpressurizes the reactor, let me go up and show you that. It overpressurizes this, the inner reactor vessel, so there's a, there's a relief valve, and the hydrogen goes out the relief valve. But by now, there are radioactive gas releases too, and it also goes out the relief valve, and the hydrogen and the radioactive gases are going out that relief valve at the top of this vessel, and there's a pipe that takes them down and brings them to this great big torus, this great big donut suppression pool, where they're directed so that they will get dissolved in that water as long as it's there and keep it from being released. And that's a design in which the exhaust gases, in the case of a very remote accident like this, go down to the torus, this big donut, and they're supposed to be condensed at least for, for as long as, you can, as it'll work. And that actually, as best we can tell, worked. But ultimately, because they couldn't restore water, and they didn't, Ultimately, what happened was this whole great big uh, black thing on this, on this drawing, this whole great big containment got overpressured by, that, by the gases and by the hydrogen and by the way, uh, various other, uh, other gases, a whole, lot of, a whole lot of heat and overpressure, and this great big thing got overpressured. The reactor operators seeing that decided that the way to save this whole thing from losing that, which is a very important vessel, was to relieve those gases. So there's a relief valve straight to the outside, relieves you to the outside, and what they want to do is relieve radioactive gases, it's not a lot of it, but it's some of it, relieve radioactive gases and hydrogen to the outside to save the pressure in there, otherwise, the, you, otherwise you get in trouble, you lose the whole thing, and then you got a much worse mess. So they decided to do that, but it turned out it was against their procedures. Excuse me, I misspoke. They didn't have written procedures for that process. Everything else before this, they had procedures, even for these unusual accidents, but they didn't have a procedure written down that enabled them to release those radioactive gases to the environment out that stack. They had to ask permission of their uh, headquarters in Tokyo. Four hours later, they kind of thought, gee, we better do that, but they didn't do it themselves. They decided to ask the government. It took three more hours. And there was a seven hour delay between when the operators in the control room decided they had to do that to save this thing and when they finally got permission to do it. During which time a whole lot more pressure and a whole lot more trouble ensued and, um, and a lot more damage took place. And I'm gonna come back later to why I think that's, that, that just doesn't make any sense, that decision process, but that's what happened. And finally, uh, finally they did and they released this this, uh, the pressure that's in this, um, this great big black thing here to the stack and it was supposed to go out to the outside. But something failed and it didn't go to the outside. We don't know why to this day. All three of them, this failed. Instead, it got released to the reactor building and the gases ended up in this space up on top, above the reactor but inside that building. And that's a lot of hydrogen and one after the other, that unit one exploded because hydrogen is explosive. All you need is a small spark and it'll explode. In unit three, hydrogen exploded. In unit two, it didn't explode because there was a hole in the side of the building about the size of a window and it escaped uh, and saved that building. I'll show you a picture later in which that building is, is okay even though um, the other two, two exploded. So they had these hydrogen explosions because that valve, that relief valve system didn't work and we don't understand to this day why it didn't work. So that's a, there are several failures here where we engineers don't understand uh, why it failed or how it failed. I'll just explain then that, that when that roof blew off, they had a whole lot of radioactive releases and that's what caused the contamination of the countryside. Well, there was water contamination too. I guess I'll come to that in a minute. So let me go down. So here's this picture again. 
um, uh, showing that. And now I'm going to keep going, and I'm going to show you a picture of what, what, what these buildings look like. Here's the unit two. You, uh, you remember how big these buildings are. That picture I showed you, that was inside this thing. These are big buildings. These are 10 stories high. There's a picture of a, right here in the unit two, of a, of a, of a window-sized hole that vented this thing so that the roof didn't blow off of it. But unit one blew off. Unit three blew off. Unit four blew off, and I'm going to come to that later to try to explain why, because uh, we, we, we're still puzzled about how that happened, because there was no fuel in the reactor there. And we're, we're still not sure how that happened, and although I'll come to it later and try to explain it. Okay. So these big explosions blew the roof off, and, uh, and of course, a lot more stuff was released that wouldn't have been. Uh, let me keep going down here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to my picture here, because I'm going to tell you a couple more things. Um, those radioactive releases occurred on the second day and on the third day. And the wind was blowing from the ocean northwest, and that's where the contamination is. I'll show you a map of that in a minute. Um, and that was what the gaseous release was. You should know that the gaseous release was, depending on, it was units one, two, and three, on the average about 5% of the radio radioactivity went out, the ga went, went out uh, airborne. In one unit it was 4%, in one unit it was 6%, it was five, roughly 5%. About 1% was a water pathway, I'm going to explain in a minute. And the rest of that, almost 95%, is still in those vessels. I'll just go back and show you. There's still either this or this, we're not sure. But they're still in the vessels, and it's really important that they stay in those vessels, because if they stay in those vessels, they're not going anywhere. And if they can stay in those vessels for years, it's great. Now, if they don't stay in the vessel, they're going to leak into this big containment thing. Well, that's okay too, but we'd much rather have them in the vessel. And for at least a month, probably a month and a half, the engineering community around the world, and I was part of it, the U.S. helping them with advice and trying to figure out what to do and what, what reactions might take place and so on, we were trying to figure out how to make absolutely sure that they could keep the stuff in the vessel where it remains, which is great. Now, one other thing has to do with seawater. After the, in each case, after the core started to melt and they had no water to put in there, they decided that, gee, they should try to inject seawater because the ocean's right there, because they didn't have any other source of water. So if you inject seawater, it's a terrible mess. It was outside their procedure. So again, they had to ask headquarters, and they had to ask uh, Tokyo, the, the, the company, Tokyo Electric Power, and they had to ask the government. And many hours later, they got permission to inject seawater, and all three of those put seawater in there, and it filled the thing up and stopped, stopped whatever was going on and stabilized it, and that was great. But they actually waited many hours to do that while they made a decision process that involved the people in, in, the, in headquarters. And in one of the units, the control room operator actually decided to overrule what headquarters was telling him to wait, and he did it without him, violating his procedures, uh, you know, putting his life and his pension at risk. You just imagine. I mean, but he did it, and he actually made one of those. I saved it in the sense that it's uh, far less released than he would have had if he, if he had to wait for, wait for permission. Now, let me try to describe why that's a problem, and it should be obvious to you. I'm almost done here. Um, when you fly in an airplane, you know, we all know, the pilot has the authority to do whatever is necessary to save the plane. They get on the phone, they talk to people, they get advice, they tell them, you know, it's wonderful. But in the end, the pilot's got the authority to save whatever, to save the plane. In our reactors, the control room chief has that authority. Doesn't, he, he can ask anybody for advice, but he's got the authority, and in Japan, they don't. If it's not in a written procedure, they don't have the authority to do it, and they didn't do it, and that's an institutional failing of the first order. And we knew this, a day or two after it happened. But on our side of the ocean, none of us said anything about it. Because the last thing we wanted to do was to be accusing them and causing them to clam up and not, not, not offering information and so on. And finally, a couple months later, they owned up to it in public, and now we're owning up, we're saying it too. They've, they've said in public, boy, that was really a dumb arrangement. And they, and they fixed it, we hope. But that's a real difficult institutional problem, not a technical problem, an institutional problem about how they ran their control set, the, the, the controlling the reactors. Because they could have saved a lot, a lot of things here had the people in the control room had that authority. Okay? Now let's talk about the waterborne pathway. Every one of these big vessels has two, you can see them here in blue, 
two loops with pumps on them, which are called recirculation loops that, 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 that pump water around the vessel just to stir it up to, so it doesn't stratify. And, the, and these things are huge. Those, these blue lines that you see here, the valves are about a meter, the, the, the flanges are about a meter around. I mean, three feet around. They're huge like this. And they're not supposed to leak, but in fact, in this core damage accident, they leaked. And the water went out here, went out another one here, went into the turbine building, went into a trench, and went into the ocean. And that's where the water came out. In our reactors, we think our designs shouldn't do that, but we're still not sure whether that's so. And until we, do, we, they, together do some examination, we're not sure whether there's some flaw in our design, too, that would cause this to happen in our designs. And if that's true, we're going to have to fix it. If it's only theirs, well, we'll learn that, too. About 1% of the radioactivity went out through the water, went into the ocean. As you probably know, it contaminated the ocean. Uh, it's contaminating uh, wildlife there. Um, it, it hasn't reached the fish yet because, you know, it first has to get to the algae and little fish. You know, by the time it gets to the fish, it takes a long time. But they're monitoring it all, and nobody's eating any fish. And in the meantime, it's a huge financial disaster. But it only was about 1% of the radioactivity. Just think how much worse it would have been if it had been much greater than that. So the waterborne pathway was the, what was the failure of these flanges. The airborne was the failure of that. It, it heated up and went out the stack. So, um, so there's a succession of, of problems here, and I'll just go over them before I talk about the other implications. Well, I'll just go down here, leave that up. First was they never should have put it at the site they put it, because that tsunami was just overwhelmed them. The reactor is just three or four miles down the coast. They were immune from the tsunami, and they came out fine, even with this huge earthquake. So that was the first thing. We don't understand that. I'm not, I'm not sure they understand it either, but that's, that's obvious in retrospect. It turns out we don't have any reactors like that in the country that are near. We have reactors in California along the coast, but they're high and dry, and there's no tsunami problem there, anything like that. We don't understand that, especially when, looking back at the records, they had huge tsunamis like this every few hundred years along that coast. In their 2,000-year history, they had three or maybe even four of them. It's hard to know. It's hazy way back in history, but they had at least three of them that were this big, and so they should have known that. Secondly, they had a blackout. They lost on-site power after they lost off-site power because the diesels were underwater. If they had been on the roof, they would have been fine. Thirdly, they had that steam-driven system, and that should have worked. We don't understand why it doesn't work. But to this day, a bunch of engineers like me, and I know those systems intimately, and we don't understand why they didn't last for days rather than only hours. And we're, we don't think it's a, it's a problem that the earthquake caused that trouble because they ran for a long time. And besides, they've been shaken on shaker tables, and they're very strong against earthquakes. So we don't really understand that. Okay. One last thing. I'm going to go back up here. Unit 4 didn't have any fuel in the reactor. The fuel was in the spent fuel pool. So the hydrogen explosion that blew off that roof couldn't have come from the fuel in the reactor. For the first month, we, the community of experts, we were sure that that was because the spent fuel pool had somehow lost cooling. It was a fresh core, remember? Just had been offloaded. It, and, and it generated hydrogen from that. But finally, six weeks later, uh, the Japanese went in and looked, and it's fine. It's full of water, and there's no radioactivity. It wasn't that. So how did this hydrogen get over here? Well, there's a pipe that goes from unit three to a stack to unit four. And it, as best we can tell, it went across this, this pipe, although we can't understand why it should have, but it, it must have, and filled up this building, and we had an explosion over there. And it seems very, very unlikely. There are check valves, and they're very strong, and we don't understand it. But there's no other uh, explanation. And in fact, I'm fond of saying something that perhaps you remember. Uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes once said that if you've ruled out all the impossible things, then the really unlikely thing is it. Well, this is really unlikely. We just don't think, but it's, but it's got to be. So they had an explosion over there that we thought was a spent fuel pool. Now we know it isn't. It had to have been hydrogen that came across from unit three to unit four and blew that thing up. Let me keep going back over here. I'll, I'll hit, oh, I'm going the other way. So here's where I was. Having explained all of these problems, I'm going to try to talk about what the global implications are here for a minute and then, then talk about the, about the United States. The global implications are still unclear. It could be that the flaws here are fundamental engineering problems that plague all of the reactors everywhere. We don't know that yet. If that's true, we're going to have some very serious either shutting down and backfits, or maybe some of them can't run. We're not sure. I'm in a community of people that are looking at this real hard. It's probably going to be a while before we know, because it's going to be a while before we can go in and inspect. Okay? 
But it could be that it's dumb, if you don't mind my saying, I hate to say that, but, he, but an easy fix. In which case, we'll do that. We don't know. It's a real comeuppance for somebody like me. I've spent you know, decades working in this field. We have thought through a whole lot of things. We thought we had thought through this sort of accident, and it happened anyway, and we don't know why. And that's, it's humbling. By the way, it's, a, it's kind of, in a macabre way, it's exciting to be involved in trying to figure this out, but it's really macabre because all those people died and we don't know why this accident happened and so on, okay? So we're still, the community's still sorting this out and it's probably gonna be a while before we do. In the meantime, I'm gonna come to the American situation now and tell you what we're doing here, just so you'll understand. Now here's a map of the US with all of our reactors. We have 104 reactors operating now. 23 of them are basically identical to the ones at Fukushima. They're boiling water reactors of the Mark I design. They're 104 altogether, and the rest of them are, 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 are similar but different. They're mostly in the east, as you can see. Uh, I live in California where there are four of them, three in Arizona. The rest of them are, are in the east. And I'm sure you know where the ones are in New England. There's one in Vermont. There was one uh, up here in Row, only uh, 35 miles from here, but it's been shut down for a decade. Uh, there's, there's one south of Boston, Connecticut, and so on. And all of these are doing something right now, which is going on, which we hope is going to at least teach us some of the lessons here. And that is every one of them is looking at the things that their reactor that we already know about and seeing whether or not they are so for them or not. And all those reports are due pretty soon. But so far, as best we can tell, none of the reactors have uncovered any of the problems with engineering design that plagued the Japanese, as best we can tell. And that's good news if it turns out to be true in the end. We don't know that it's true in the end, but we're gonna find out. Uh, it'll probably be a while before we, we've tracked it all down, and after they get in there and clean the thing up, there are gonna be some more engineering problems, we're gonna have to track them down, and there may be some fixes, but so far, it doesn't look like, like, like any of this is plaguing us. Our reactors can survive a blackout for a much longer time than that. At least they were supposed to too, although those things failed and we don't know why yet. So we're gonna, we're gonna get to the bottom of that. Next, I'm gonna talk about radioactivity because I'm gonna explain what the significance was of the releases. I have to talk about the average dose to people in the United States, and this is true in Japan also. Uh, the average person, you and me and everybody else here, uh, not counting medical radiation, we all get between two and 300 millirem per year. Millirem is a unit of radiation dose. And a lot of it comes from the rocks and the soil that we live on, and so it varies a lot. From, if you're in the Berkshires, you get more than if you're along the coast. And uh, there's some cosmic radiation, and if you move to Denver, you get a lot more because it's, it's higher and there's more in the rocks and more cosmic radiation. We had a, a granddaughter living in Boulder for a while in Colorado, and up there, instead of uh, about 300, they get about twice that. So the natural sources of radioactivity and a little bit from consumer products are about 300 milliram per year, or 200, it varies. And on average in the United States, and this is true in every advanced country like Japan, there's another 300 or so that comes from medical. Not everybody gets it. I mean, I, did, I had some last year and the year before I didn't. You know how it is. But the average is people get about another 300 milligram. And on average in the United States, somebody, uh, just a normal citizen, gets about 600, as it says, 620. And I want you to keep those milligram in mind because I'm about to describe the impact on Japan. Okay? And they're about the same. And by the way, nobody thinks that 600 milligram is a terrible health hazard because when people look and study, and I said you move to Denver, you get twice as much, you study that, you move to higher elevation, you get even more. Studies haven't shown any, uh, any observable effects from that, although there, there's some suspicion there may be some, but they're, if they're, they must be very small because they never see anything from this. It takes much higher doses than that to cause trouble. Now here's a map of Japan. Uh, this was taken in, in early April, and these blue lines are just flight patterns of an American plane that was flying measuring airborne radioactivity, but that's not the point of the slide. There's that red dot is where the reactors are. And the first circle is 20 kilometers, it's 12 miles. The next circle is 30 kilometers, about 19 miles. And the biggest circle is 80 kilometers, about 50 miles. So these are 12, uh, about 20, and about 50 mile circles around the reactor site. And this, this, these measurements were made uh, three weeks after the accident, but it's about the same. And when the releases occurred, the wind was blowing from southeast to northwest, and the big contamination is in a zone here that you can see, it's yellow and sort of orange up here, and it extends about 20 miles out from the reactor site, and is about three or four miles wide. And that's where the contamination is big. Everybody's been evacuated from this whole area, but in that area, they're not gonna be able to reoccupy that for a long time. 
probably they're going to have to take down all the houses and cover the and haul away and build a new in there. There are 40 odd thousand people affected by that. In these other areas, they're going to be able to reoccupy. Maybe there may be a few hot spots there, measure them one by one and make sure, but the other areas they'll reoccupy, although they did evacuate uh, much larger. And the area that's sort of in blue out here is real, real low. That's, that's elevated compared to background, but it's more like twice, so it's sort of like living in Denver, and nobody, nobody, nobody thinks that's big. So the area of contamination is in a zone that is uh, like I showed. Now, the Japanese have adopted the following criterion. If the dose in a year is 2,000 milligram, you can't go back. If it's less, you can. Now remember, the, the natural background is about 600, uh, no, 300, and then another 300 for medical. And as I said people, at, people in the Rocky Mountains get you know eight or nine hundred. They've decided that two thousand is their criterion. In, higher than that, they can't. They're, they're going to have to clean it up. And that zone with forty odd thousand people extends about twenty miles out and three or four miles wide, as you can see on this map. Okay. People outside that zone may have. Uh, there may be case by case. They have to do some cleanup, but most of it will be okay. Now the first three miles were all destroyed by the tsunami, but outside that the houses are fine. They're just, they look fine. They're contaminated with the radioactivity. They look fine. So um, if they can clean them up, perhaps they don't have to take them down. They're doing a lot of work now to try to figure out what to do. And in the meantime, those 40 odd thousand people have been evacuated. And they're living in temporary shelter. And they're, by the way, their businesses and some of his farms and so on. But there's one saving grace, and that has to do with the discipline of the Japanese. And it would be true here also. Nobody in the public got any exposures that mattered here. And the reason is they evacuated right away, and they evacuated except for the, uh, I mean, they evacuated from the radioactivity. You know, they had two days to do that. I'm not talking about the tsunami evacuation, but the people that were left, they evacuated for the radioactivity before it was released. No member of the public has, has gotten any, any, any radioactivity to speak of because they've all been evacuated. I mean, it's contaminated the area, but not the people. They're measuring the water, they're measuring the food. Some of it's contaminated, nobody's eaten it. They're measuring the fish. Not much yet. Maybe later. No one's eating it. So even though the economic impact is huge, as best we can tell, because of the discipline, they're interdicting all that matters, and no one in the public is getting anything radioactive. And that's a terrific statement about their discipline and being able to make the measurements and you know, people paying attention. So that's good. Unfortunately, there were several people in the plant that got serious uh, doses. Two at least that got really serious radioactive doses. Um, looks, looks, we're not sure yet. I'm not an expert. And another 10 or 15 that got doses that they shouldn't have got that probably won't lead to disease. They don't really know, and they're, they're going to follow them. So there were a few people in the plant site that got radioactive doses that are tragic and we wish didn't happen. But I want to put this in the context of 26,000 people lost their lives in the tsunami. Okay, just don't forget that. Um, Finally, and I'll just leave you with this thought, we have, like the Japanese, evacuation plans for all of our reactors. And there's, they, they did it, and it worked. I'm talking about the radioactive one. You know, they, they had several day, they, a couple days anyway, and they got them out. The tsunami, they only had 45 minutes. They didn't get everybody out. But for the radioactive, they got everybody out. There was no, uh, there, there was no problem with that. And we have those two around all of our reactors, as perhaps you know, and they do training. And we have confidence that if something like this happened at one of our reactors, we'd get them out too. It would be a terrible contamination disaster and a big economic loss, but um, we don't think that, uh, that, that these people are, uh, we're, we're not protected. I'm going to close just with the economic impact, and then I'll stop and ask you for, if you have any questions. The economic impact is as follows. To clean up the radioactive contamination in this zone is thought to be between 20, 30, 40 billion dollars. It's a lot of money. To clean up the reactors and bury all that stuff a few years hence is going to be 10 or so billion, maybe 20. They're not sure. 10 or 20 for the reactors, 20, 30, 40 for that. The tsunami cleanup is 500, 600, perhaps even 800 billion. And remember, 26,000 already died. So as big as the reactor is, economic impact, it pales compared to the impact of that tsunami. I'll just leave you with that thought. We've got to remember that we're talking about the reactor because that's what everybody's interested in. That's what I do for a living. But um, the failure here, the societal failure here, was their failure to understand how big a tsunami might hit them and their failure to protect against it. 
the uh, reactor failure was some engineering things that we're getting to the bottom of, and we will someday know more than we do know, and we're either going to shut them down and fix them or maybe have to shut them down entirely. We just don't know. Okay. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs>